Hello folks. I want to do a little video today just to show you my top five beauty tips. No, obviously not. Um, but I'm going to show you the oldest things that I own. Um, and perhaps you can comment below and tell me the oldest things you own. Anyway, it's certainly not that bicycle over there. The uh, electric bike, that's only 2018. I've got um, underpants that are older than that. It's not that radio behind me. That's only 1940 something. It's a wartime utility radio. Um, no, I've got things that are older than that. And the oldest thing I've got in the house by a long, long way is this. No, not, not the jar, no, the stuff inside it, the water, H2O. By far and away the oldest thing any of us have got because it's all about three and a half billion years old. All the liquid water on the planet um, is all easily that old. If not older, even a billion years older than that maybe. But the moon came along and hit the planet, got rid of a lot of it, but it all came back to us from the Kuiper Belt. It's one thing that creationists and scientists can agree on, is that water is one of the first things on the planet. All the rocks that make up the planet have been turned over by tectonic action and um, you know, recycled and melted and changed. But water is about the oldest thing on the planet. It's really good for helping the throat, which is a bit sore at the moment. But anyway, uh, moving on, you're thinking, it's a very short video, Wayne. Very, very short video. You've just told me water's the oldest thing you own and that everybody owns it. Great. But no, um, I do have older things. And they're all here. And I'm going to bring you over to have a closer look and talk you through them. And I hope you enjoy it. Come over here and have a look. So, here are some of the things I own that are really rather old. Now then, this, I must just point out that none of these things have been taken from an archaeological context, or uh, they weren't found in an archaeological context, so they're of little value to uh, science, really. But the ones that are of interest, I have notified the... Uh, British Museum and they're aware of and have recorded. So let's start with this. This here I believe is a trilobite. Now it's been turned to um, flint over the millennia as you can see. I'm pretty sure it's a trilobite. I'm guessing this is probably the head end, this is the body and that's the tail end. Trilobites like a little sea anthropod. Um, they're around from oh, 500 million years ago in the uh, Cambrian period, all the way up to mass extinctions 250 million years ago. I found that um, on a gravel driveway some years ago. don't exactly remember where, but I remember finding it and being amazed. I might have been sat in a pub, actually, in a, on some gravel in a pub. Either way, that's pretty old. Now, uh, a bit newer. Now then, a, a bit newer is this chap. I found him in my garden. I live on Chalk Downland, and that is a sort of sea urchin type character, a very early sea urchin, an echinoid. That is, now they would say the chalk around here is 95 to 85 million years old. So that's pretty, pretty old, isn't it? I think you'll agree. Pretty, pretty old and fascinating sort of thing. Made out of chalk. It's the skeleton or the remains of an echinoid. And here is another one. This one I think I would have found on a beach or on the Thames foreshore. Um, I have a permit to uh, take things from the Thames foreshore, things I find in my eyes only. You can get one of those from the Port of London Authority. 
it's about 80 pounds i think um i've not been able to use mine this year so it's not been a great investment but still it's an interesting thing to do if you want to do things illegally which i think you should really uh, now these are very interesting um apart from being a good uh, you know, uh, 95 years uh, 95 million years old they were also found um They've been very significant to mankind for a while, really, because in 1887, a chap called Worthington Smith, sorry, I should just focus that, a chap called Worthington Smith found a 4,000-year-old grave on Dunstable Downs of a mother and child that was surrounded by thousands of these, or at least hundreds of these. So, you know, they had some interest, significance for people over the years. I've certainly always been fascinated by fossils. Um, so, moving on. So you're thinking, well, that's all well and good, Wayne, but these fossils are not really, you know, anything man-made, are they? So, the next thing we can move on to, which is old, that is, that is man-made, are these relics from the First World War. This is a German bullet. Just focus you on there. This is a German bullet. This is a German bullet um, recovered from the Western Front. Again, not from any archaeological context, just um, simply on the ground, um, by the side of the road somewhere in a ditch. Uh, I'll flash up some pictures of some other finds. Um, you should be very careful. Well, A, you know, respect it's a war grave type area. The entire Western Front could be considered the war grave. Um, obviously, they're ploughed up regularly for agriculture, everything else. But 100 years ago, men were firing these things at each other. And much worse, gas, artillery shells, everything else. Um, so, yeah, there's a 100-year-old German bullet and here is it's slightly smaller British counterpart so deadly a full metal jacket round designed to kill from a um, from a British short magazine the Enfield rifle no doubt possibly a machine gun um, Definitely wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of that. Now we're back to man-made stuff and we're beyond anything that anybody alive um, witnessed. There's nobody alive now who witnessed the First World War firsthand. And here is another item which is genuinely shrapnel a lot of people describe shrapnel as just shards of metal from artillery rounds everything else but this is the original shrapnel packed in their hundreds into high explosive rounds which would spread these lead balls all over the place absolutely devastating to man and beast and this one well not necessarily this one but one like it has hit this short magazine, the Enfield Bullet. And you can see the damage it's done. Now, whether or not this hit it in flight, so to speak, is probably debatable. It more than likely, or at least one like it, more than likely hit it when it was already on the ground. But you could imagine, if you wanted to, if you were a you know, speculating wildly that that was flying through the uh, through the air towards somebody and got hit by a shrapnel ball simultaneously, maybe saving somebody's life, who knows. So that's a fascinating item from uh, the Western Front in Europe. Moving on, I've shown you this coin before in the previous video. Um, let me try and grab it. I don't know if you can see, that says, let me try and get a magnifying glass on there for you. 
that says 1878. Does that work? I'm making it better. Not really, does it? Okay. Anyway, the date of this coin, I think in the previous video, I said 1873. But it's actually 1878. I found it metal detecting in Surrey on a, uh, with a metal detecting club. And it's a little bit worn where it's been buried so long. But interestingly, 1878 is the same year that Graham Alexander Bell um, demonstrated his telephone to Queen Victoria at Osborne House on the Isle of Wight and was able to make what we would now laughingly consider um, but was able to make a long distance phone call. Osborne House on the Isle of Wight is near Cowes so he first phoned Cowes, <coughs> not the not the bovine animal, the uh, small town on the, on the north of the Isle of Wight uh, he made a telephone call to Cowes, which is across the River Medina from Osborne House. And then he phoned Southampton, which is across the Solent. And then he phoned London, which is obviously where Buckingham Palace is. So the Queen was very familiar with how long that took to get there. And she could speak to somebody on the other end of a telephone instantaneously. So quite fascinating. Going back in time a little bit there. Again, this is all stuff now beyond anybody that's still alive and kicking. So now we come to this, which is basically a cartwheel penny from 1897. But you'll notice it's been overstamped with a Lloyd's Weekly newspaper. 3D, three penny, posted free. Now then, who was Lloyd, you're asking? Lloyd was Edward Lloyd, and he decided to uh, make newspapers. But he didn't really want to pay the tax on making newspapers. Uh, so this is in 1842, thereabouts. Uh, he really didn't fancy paying the tax. So he would make newspapers that were uh, illustrated and wrote about stories that were relevant to the day, relevant to that particular week, but were historic, so that he could get away with saying it's not a newspaper, it's you know it's sort of a, you know, some other form of publication that you don't have to pay tax on. Anyway, that didn't last long, and he decided in the end that he would um, actually pay the tax and in 1843 he made Lloyd's weekly newspaper uh, and reported the news as, as he saw it but you're wondering now why this cartwheel penny from 1797 has been overstamped and the reason is um, between 1797 and about 1860 these were legal tender still when they were made in 1897, they were um, worth a penny, literally a penny in copper. And as things went on, wars with France and everything else, commodity prices changing, they suddenly became actually worth more than a penny. So the Royal Mint decided, or the Soho Mint, um, decided it wasn't really practicable. And Britain was in an awful state with its coinage at the time. Britain... Um, couldn't really produce until this coin Britain couldn't really produce enough coins it was in a terrible mess and uh, things weren't getting any better with the introduction of this one really anyway um, what Edward Lloyd decided to do was use these pennies um, he defaced them which you could get away with back in those days and he would uh, pay his staff with them so that when his staff went to the shop and bought their groceries they would use these pennies and as a form of advertising, this would then get about. Now then, <clears throat> also interestingly, in 1843, uh, Edward Lloyd decided to uh, post out these newspapers to his clients 
And uh, you, you can see on this one, so this dates this pretty precisely to around 1843, really, or at least the overstamping. And um, this now says that it's three pence, three D, post free. But it wasn't really post free. All he'd done was um, add the postage onto the price of the newspaper. So that your 3p newspaper was only really a penny and you were paying the postage up front anyway. So a bit of a shark, I suppose, really. Um, you know, like a lot of newspaper owners. So there we go. Uh, moving on. These clay pipe bowls. These clay pipe bowls. Let's see, that one's been smoked. Um, so is this one. You can see the different sizes. And this is how we date them. This one is approximately from, say, 1680. Let's just focus it. This one is from 1680 to about 1710, something like that. Um, please comment below if you know better. There's no markings on it, but found in the Thames by me, and it's pretty old. But this one is even older. This one dates to before that period. Let me just run hold it steady for you. This one dates um, to more like 1620 to 1660. It's got quite a narrow heel on it. A very small bowl. See, the smaller the bowl, the older the pipe. Because tobacco was expensive back in the day. And, uh, you know, you, you paid for these pipes, you had it filled with tobacco, and you didn't want to be spending too much to ruin your health. Talking of ruined health, let me just take another sip of water. So there we go, a nice little clay pipe bowl from about 1620-ish. So remembering that the Great Fire of London is 1666, that almost predates the, uh, the Great Fire, doesn't it? So quite possibly the person that smoked that witnessed the Great Fire of London, which is something to think about, isn't it? So what do we have next? Now then, this here fits into the hand quite nicely. And I'm told, or at least I believe, um, it's a handle from, so when, when you're roasting your meat on the fire, when you're cooking in some house or hovel in London, um, you've got the drips coming off the joint of meat and you want to collect that because that's tasty and it's, you know, it can be used. And so you collect it in a drip tray and that is the handle for a drip tray. I didn't know what it was at first. But I did speak to um, a very knowledgeable chap called Richard Henry. You should definitely look up on... Um, no, I don't remember where I spoke to him. I can't remember if I spoke to him through his website or through his YouTube or maybe even through the uh, River Thames mudlarking finds. But he did tell me that this was post-medieval or likely post-medieval and that was likely what it was. Um... If I remember the conversation correctly, I'm sure I can be corrected if that's wrong. But um, that's how I remember that. So that's at least 500 years old. So post-medieval drip tray handle. You can imagine somebody easily moving that around. Uh, found on the Thames. I, I find that fairly interesting. I think somebody 500 years ago was using that in their day-to-day -day cooking. Now, a little bit older than that is this one. You can see those white dots in there. They are shells, because this is shell-tempered ware. So those little bits of shell, I'm told, when they're different sizes like this, are most likely Roman. Um, and when they're more even, more likely Saxon. Either way, that was again another London Thames foreshore find. It's only a tiny little shard. But um, that's easily 2,000 years old. Which 
is again amazing. Somebody was using that for their tea or something. Um, you know, their, their evening meal 2,000 years ago. The shell temper helps to strengthen the, the clay as it's fired. Now we move on to the considerably older items. This is quite a significant thing, really. This is a shard of a broken hand axe. Well, not a hand axe, a broken Stone Age Neolithic axe from at least 2,500 BC. You can see it's broken um, and possibly reworked. It's very smooth here. Now, the Neolithic farmers that came up... Um, slowly from the fertile crescent of the Middle East, made their way over thousands of years through Europe and finally to the British Isles, would use axes like this to chop down the forests so they could grow their crops and they could um, you know, raise their animals. And these were very handy tools. Unfortunately, this one broke. And I really do believe that somebody thought, well, rather than just letting it go, it's, even today, it's still got a very good edge on it. Rather than just wasting it, let's reuse it as a, a scraper or a, something else. Um, and it probably was you know, useful for somebody for a long time after it broke. I'm sure this has been polished again here. And I think these edges have been chipped off to make it more comfortable in the hand. You see? So anyway, that's very old. That's, you know, looks like at least... 2,000 years before um, BC. So that's an old piece. Slightly older still, and by far and away the oldest thing I own, is another shirt of axe. And you see I, this is broken also, unfortunately. And you can see I've done it here so that you can get an idea to the shape of these things. So you'd have a wooden shaft here, just change that. Uh, we have a wooden shaft, and this would be the sharp pointy end that would do the chopping, and this would go into a socket of a piece of timber, and then this would be the other end. Now then, what's interesting about this piece though, this has been recorded with the British Museum, is that it's a shirt of jadeite axe. Now then, Jadeite comes from the uh, northern Italian Alps and it's absolutely useless as an axe. So why would people make axes out of jadeite? Well, in sunlight, I mean it looks pretty good here, but in sunlight this thing positively glows and it really is a beautiful, beautiful piece of stone. And they say, um, I'm told by scientists, that this archaeologist, that this um, would take about 500 hours by a man or a woman polishing it until it became, this has now been knocking around in the ground for a long time. It was found in a ploughed field. As I say, there's no, no um, archaeological context, unfortunately. It wasn't found as part of a burial anywhere. So, excuse my throat. Hang on, let me have another sip of water. Oh dear. <clears throat> anyway, uh, so yeah, about 500 hours for some man or woman to polish to an absolute mirror finish and still absolutely no use as an axe. So it's been speculated and widely accepted that these must have been very important um, items in a sort of religious sense or, or um, you know, they were a status symbol. You know, the, only the absolute elite would be able to afford either the time or whatever, you know, whatever passed for money at the time um, to have something like this. And it must have been very important. And apparently, occasionally, they were broken um, as a symbolic gesture. You know, I'm so wealthy that I can afford to sacrifice this to the gods. Um, but apparently this one isn't broken in antiquity. This one is broken by the plough. Um a look at the break there so unfortunately somewhere is the other part to this I'm sure and these were 
sometimes quite large items that were often um, reshaped and, you know, apparently, this is what I'm told, were reshaped and uh, kept by the various elites as status symbols. So they would get smaller and smaller each time they're broken and reshaped and remolded and spread amongst the elites of the tribes. Um, obviously they get smaller and smaller. So this would be actually be quite a small one, but not insignificant size. Wouldn't it be nice to have the whole thing? Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching. This is by far the oldest thing I own. And this is a good 4,000 BC. So that makes it a good 6,000 years old. What's the oldest thing you own? Please comment below and let me know. Hope you've enjoyed this video. If you've watched this far, consider subscribing and click the bell icon. We can get this channel growing if we if you uh, subscribe. It really helps me out. So thanks for watching. Stay safe. God bless you. Let's hope that you can avoid the COVID and enjoy future videos. Catch up soon.